here in North Carolina and all over uh, all over the world, certainly in the United States, <coughs> November brings the hunting season. And for the men, this is a very uh, important season to uh, help supply meat for their families. And we have today the great one of the one of the great patrons of the hunters, and that is Saint Eustace. His other name that he was born with was Placidus, Placid. But his uh, Catholic name is Eustace. And Saint Eustace, he was a very good Roman soldier. He grew up in a Roman family. He was of noble birth. He was his family was wealthy, and he was made by Emperor Trajan, he was made the general of the Roman army. So he was a very high-ranking soldier, of course. And he had married a beautiful wife named, named Theopista, and he had two sons, Agapitus and, and Theopistus. So those are very Roman names. And he's the famous saint who, while hunting, he was chasing a gigantic buck and with his bow and arrow he was following the trail and coming onto a, a clearing and on a hill he saw the buck facing him and he pulled his bow to shoot but this buck suddenly the light shone around his head and all between his antlers he saw the figure of our Lord Jesus Christ hanging on the cross. And our Lord Jesus Christ, the King, who we must hunt after with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. As, as Eustace hunted this animal, and Christ spoke to him. And you can find the whole dialogue in the lives of of the saints, or what's called the Golden Legend, written by Jac Father Jacobus de Verangine, the medieval work. It's a tremendous, great work. And in that book, you will find the full passage of what our Lord said to him. But our Lord basically told him, you're seeking, you're seeking me, and I have been seeking you. And he, I want you to go to Bishop so-and-so to be baptized. I want to enroll you in my army. And so Placid, St. Eustace, he obeyed the voice of our Lord but that he saw and heard in this buck, and the buck disappeared. And so St. Eustace was baptized in his whole family, his wife and his two children. And afterwards, our Lord told him he would endure much suffering for his sake. And this is what happened. Eustace, St. Eustace, endured with marvelous patience the almost incredible misfortunes which in a very brief space of time reduced him to direst poverty. Compelled to escape in great secrecy, he was afflicted grievously on his journey, first by the capture of his wife and then of his sons. So his sons and his wife were kidnapped. Overwhelmed by all these misfortunes, he concealed himself for a long time in a distant province, working as a farmer. He remained there until a voice from heaven restored him, cured his sickness, and also the Emperor Trajan was seeking him out for the new war. And so St. Eustace, this time a Catholic soldier and a general, he led the whole army under Emperor Trajan's orders to conquer an enemy territory. And when they came back victorious in the whole city, as, the, as Rome used to do, the whole city would come out to greet the, the, the glorious, victorious army of Rome. And of course, St. Eustace was received as a hero and the great ticket parade and all the trumpets blowing and the horses marching. And behind them, they had all the spoils and the slaves and the gold and the riches of the lands that they conquered. 
And so all of Rome was celebrating this with the, the circus and with the races and competitions for days. And so during one of these banquets, St. Eustace was called upon by the emperor himself in a very public manner to burn incense to the gods of Rome. And so all the soldiers who were in attendance and all the people who were in attendance and their wives and their families at this huge banquet expected to see St. Eustace take some incense, as everybody did, and burn to the gods of Rome. And this meant you, this meant you were patriotic to your country. This meant you had the virtue of patriotism. And it was unthinkable that you would not honor the gods of Rome. Very similar to us Americans, we have to have the virtue of patriotism. We must love our country because our country is, is from God. He gave us a beautiful land. But a Catholic must love his country correctly, just like St. Eustace had to love his country correctly. And he loved Christ the King first. And he could not give honor to the errors of his country. Just like we American Catholics, we cannot accept religious liberty. We cannot accept modern democracy. We cannot <coughs> accept the errors on which our country is founded, the Freemasonic errors of separation of church and state, liberty of the press, liberty of the speech, liberty of to teach what you want. And all these errors, which is not my opinion, it's the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church of Tradition, guided by the Holy Ghost, Pope after Pope, in the last 200 years have condemned the modern errors. And that's the problem with American Catholics. We have liberalism in our blood. Vatican II fits us. It fits us. And that's why we liberal Catholics, even us traditional Catholics, are very liberal. We are so liberal it's in our blood and we have to wash it out. We have to soak it out. How? We got to rip it out. We got to surgically <laughs> cut it out. How? Read the papal encyclicals. Read the writings of Archbishop Lefebvre, especially the Ellen Crowden. And read the writings of Father Dennis Fahey. He's been removed from most society bookstores because he exposes Judeo Masonry and their control of money, their control of the finances. But that's the truth. That's the way it is. And we Catholics love the truth. True Catholics, we must love the truth. That means we must love our country. And that means to love it as Catholics must, which is that Christ must be king of our country. His laws must be held in our Constitution. And his name in the Blessed Trinity should be named in our Constitution. And that, that liberalism in the United States goes way back to Cardinal Gibbons. Cardinal Gibbons said, if I was asked to change one word of the Constitution, I wouldn't touch it. That was back in the 1800s. And so Pope Leo XIII had to slap him on the hand. He should have did more than that. But Leo XIII slapped him on the hand with an encyclical called Testem Benevolentiae, condemning what was called the heresy of Americanism. And this is not, I'm an American and we love our country, and we Catholics, we must love our country correctly. And this has been, I think, and maybe this is why God has allowed a punishment on the Society of St. Pius X, because many of our schools are continuing the age-old liberalism in our 50s textbooks. Our history, we don't tell our youth about Freemasonry. We don't tell them about the battle between Christ the King and Satan. We don't inspire our youth with the real heroes of this country, which are the martyrs the Franciscan missionaries, the Jesuit missionaries, and all the, the martyrs of this country. And they instead they, they hear all about the founding Masonic Fathers. And they, granted they have to learn this, it's part of history, but they have to learn it the way Catholics must learn it. 
that the real founding fathers were those who carried the real Statue of Liberty, the Franciscans, brought Our Lady La Conquistadora, the Blessed Virgin Mary, who stands in Santa Fe Basilica down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There you see her on the epistle side, side altar, a beautiful little statue. That's the real Mother of Liberty. And so St. Eustace, like so many Roman martyrs, they were hated. Why? Because they were looked upon as unpatriotic. You don't love your country. You don't love your land. And they say, yes, we do. That's why I fought for it. That's why I conquered for Rome. But I love it correctly because I love the true God and Christ the King first. And that's what St. Eustace stood for. And his great wife and his two sons, they also stood firm. And none of them would burn incense to the gods of Rome. So what happened? After he had been tempted by various subterfuges, he was offered many deals. Look, uh, Eustace, think of your wife, think of your children. I'll give you $5,000, just burn incense, it's nothing. I'll give you a bonus, I'll give you a vacation to the Mediterranean Sea on the coast. Just burn incense. And the emperor kept trying to, to attract him by many offers and deals. And they, I'm sure they tried ambiguous language as well. And he wouldn't go for it. So then they resorted to threats. If you don't, if you don't burn incense, you just, I'm going to be obliged to put you in prison. I'm going to be obliged to put you to death. I can't endure this embarrassment as an emperor to have one of my generals so unpatriotic to Rome. And St. Eustace said, Your Highness, I honor you and I respect your authority, but there is one higher than you, and that's Jesus Christ the King. Him I adore and Him I do not, I cannot betray. And so what happened? He, with his wife and his children, were thrown to the lions. The gentleness of these animals towards the victims infuriated the emperor even more, because these lions didn't devour them, just licked their feet. <laughs> he, so he ordered the martyrs to be shut within the brazen bull heated by a fire underneath. And many martyrs went through this death. And so there they were heard singing the praises of God, probably the Psalms. And they gave their testimony to him to the very end. And then the breviary says, Then their souls took flight to eternal happiness on the 20th day of September. Their bodies were found perfectly intact and buried reverently by the faithful. And later they were transferred and given honorable burial in the church that bears their name. So here, the glorious champions, the whole family, dying for the Catholic faith. But in men's eyes, they were ashamed. They were humiliated. In men's eyes, they were thrown out. In men's eyes, they were cast out like trash and put to death like criminals. And this is, these are the real heroes, because they teach us we must love Jesus Christ the King first. And every day we face temptations, choices, occasions where we, we can choose, we can put Christ second, we can put him third, but every day we have to strive always to put him first. And that's what sin is about. Sin is to turn our back to God to turn our back to the laws of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why every day it's a battle to put him first in our thoughts, in our affections, in our duties of state. And we have to put the duties towards God on the highest priority, the prayer, daily prayer, throughout the day, spiritual communions, 
study, study your catechism and know the faith and know the fight we're in now. You've got to read. And a good website is the Recusant and Resistere. And there's a whole list of them. I'm not, I don't remember them all right now. But Resistere, uh, the Recusant, there's some very good reading. And the, all the Archbishop's writings, you notice that the new direction of the Society of Pius X, they cannot quote Archbishop Lefebvre for very long. They can only take little pieces that fit their new direction. But only the resistance priests and those of the SSPX Marian Corps, in other words, the real SSPX of tradition, we can quote him and we love to quote him because it shows, quoting him at length, how opposed he was to this whole idea of, of agreement with Rome, this whole idea of, of accepting the new mass as legitimate, and Vatican II being corrected in the light of tradition. That's a bunch of baloney. In 1977, he did say, well, all right, we can take the council, and what's bad, we reject. What's doubtful, we interpret in the light of tradition, and what's good, we accept. He said that in 1977. It is true. But we all make mistakes. And 10 years later, Archbishop Lefebvre, and then uh, 12 years later, he said, now that I reread the council and restudy it, I see that the whole thing is perverse through and through. And he says the whole thing is based on subjectivist philosophy. So the whole thing is poison. And he will write to his priests in this book, which is really a last testament to his priests, Spiritual Journey, and he says in here, uh, if a Catholic priest wants to keep his faith, he has to steer far from the conciliar church, far from that council, that poisonous council of Vatican II. And so why is this district, why are the superiors of the SSPX saying now, well, we can correct it in the light of tradition. We can interpret it now in the light of tradition. That's baloney. That's a lie. <laughs> And it will only lead to liberal death. That's what it leads to. You cannot interpret it. You cannot correct it. Vatican II is for the fires of hell from which it came. And someday the Catholic Church will condemn it. And it already stands condemned by all of tradition. And Pope Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, who is responsible for, for the overthrow of Christ the King in the Catholic Church and prostrated himself before some schismatic apostate, well, a schismatic bishop of the, of the Russian or Greek Orthodox. Pope Paul VI, to his shame, and John XXIII, to his shame, they refused the Holy Ghost at the Council. They told the Holy Ghost, get lost. Man is now going to settle this problem of the modern world. And they refuse their infallible authority. So when you hear a society priest starting to say, well, we can take the council and interpret in the light of tradition, the council from day one started off on the wrong foot. They refuse the Holy Ghost. And that's enough for us to say the council's for the fires from which it came from. So, dear faithful, let me just quote our dear founder, Archbishop Lefebvre. Listen to his words. Just as the Israel of the Old Testament had a troubled history because of continuous infidelities towards God, which were often the works of its leaders and its Levites, that is, its priests. So in other words, the Israelites, the, the Jews of old, the, the religion, the true religion before Christ was not always pristine. So many infidelities, so many apostasies, so many times spitting in Christ's face. So does the church militant in this world know without end periods of trial on account of, guess what? Because of the infidelity of its priests and their compromises with the world. 
And there's a saying, all evil comes from the clergy. The opposite is true. All good comes through the clergy. That's why when you have saintly bishops doing their duty, saintly popes, saintly priests, what a transformation in society. But when the scandals come from popes and bishops and priests, oh, so many souls are scandalized and go to hell. And this is what he says. The higher they come from these scandals, the more scandals provoke disasters. Certainly the church itself guards its sanctity and its sources of sanctification. But the control of its institutions by unfaithful popes and apostate bishops, think of Cardinal Dolan in New York City, now permitting the perverts to march in the St. Patrick Parade. What a scandal. What a horrible scandal. Apostate bishops ruin the faith of the faithful and the clergy sterilizes the instruments of grace, that is, kills the grace of the sacrament, and favors the assault of all the powers of hell, which seem to triumph. This apostasy makes its members adulterers, schismatics, opposed to all tradition. So let Navasoto Catholics wake up and realize they are schismatic. They are not with the Roman Catholic Church. Those who follow Vatican II, they are the schismatics. Those who want to interpret Vatican II in the light of tradition, they are stepping towards apostasy to the false church. They separate themselves from the past of the Catholic Church and thus separated from the church in the measure that it remains faithful to the Church of our Lord. Everyone who remains faithful to the true Church is now the object of savage and continuous persecution. Didn't he know? Suffering in 1976 a so-called suspension, and then in 88 a so-called excommunication, and continual, continual attacks from the media, attacks from fellow bishops, and priests and the faithful. Archbishop Lefebvre was, was the rebellious, disobedient prelate. But he knew where obedience lied. He knew the true obedience. We first owe obedience to God, Jesus Christ the King, the Catholic truth and magisterium, and then men who follow this. And if the Pope or Bishop Specs step out of line, they, they lose the right to our obedience to them. And so be, to be truly obedient, we must obey the truth. And that's why the Freemasons said 150 years ago, we will destroy the Catholic Church. How? Through obedience. It happened at Vatican II, and it's happening now in the Society of St. Pius X. They will destroy Catholic tradition through a false obedience to Bishop Fillet and the leaders, who are leading them right into the conciliar church, and tomorrow, Bishop Fillet will be talking to Cardinal Mueller and uh, Monsignor Pozzo of Ecclesia Dei will probably be there. He's, he's in Rome now. And uh, he's meeting with these wolves. Are they interested in Catholic tradition? No way. Are they interested in the reign and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary? They laugh at it. Are they interested in salvation of souls? Not at all. Why is he meeting with them? He should tell them, like Archbishop Lefebvre told them, if you want to discuss again, I would gladly do so, but on the level of doctrine. And when you profess, once again, Pius IX, Quanta Cura, and Syllabus of Errors, Pius X, on Modernism, Pius XI, on the reign of Christ the King, and Pius XII, condemning the modern liturgy, then we'll discuss but until then, no discussion. And the Bishop, the Bishop Fillet had his model, had his instructions from our founder. And now he, like a little bratty kid, he turns his back and says, I'll do what I want. I have a better solution. And now, as the three bishops warned him back in 2012, don't do this. 
Don't go in this direction. It'll cause confusion. It'll cause infidelity to the faith. It'll cause the loss of souls. And pardon me for the, uh, the example, but it's, it is like a spoiled little kid <laughs> who says, I'll do it my way and I have the solution. And he won't listen to the wise words of Bishop Williamson and the then wise words of Bishop Tissier and the then, the then, then wise warnings of Bishop Galaretta. And then plus, as Father de Marode, who's now with the resistance in France, Father de Marode, he warned and he wrote to Bishop Fillet and said, our founder told you not to make peace with the enemies in Rome until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. There's your instructions. Words are perfectly Catholic Pope. Far from it. Why are you seeking to make peace with these enemies? Everyone who remains faithful to the true church is the object of savage and continuous persecution. And now you see more and more persecution against the resistance. Father LaRue's recent letter and many of our faithful are dead scared. They're scared. Since when has fear entered the parish halls <laughs> of the coffee and donuts? <laughs> but nobody can, dares to mention the resistance, the errors of Bishop Fillet, the doctrinal declaration, what's going on now. Even John Benari, he's a good man. God bless him. Pray for him. Pray that he'll have strength like Louis Voyot, the great Catholic journalist of old, to put anything of the resistance in his papers. Why? He knows the society will completely cut him off. It will completely cut him off. Persecution. And I close with these great words of Archbishop Lefebvre, the last paragraph from uh, Spiritual Journey. But we are not the first to be persecuted by false brethren for having kept the true faith and tradition. The martyrology teaches us this every day. The martyrology is the, the book that praises every day the birthday of the martyrs, of all the martyrs every day. And today is St. Eustace and his wife and two sons. The more Holy Church is insulted, the more we must cling to her. Of course, he means the Church of Catholic tradition. We must cling to her with our body and soul. The more we must force ourselves to defend Mother Church and to assure her continuity by drawing from her treasures of sanctity to reconstruct Christianity, to reconstruct the Catholic social order, to reconstruct a whole civilization built on the kingship of Christ. That's what we're supposed to be about, us Catholics. And it starts firstly with our soul, it starts secondly with our families, it starts thirdly with our cities and schools and parishes and monasteries and convents. And it starts spreading to the nation, the conversion of this nation, and our leaders in the eventual reign of Christ the King. But this won't happen unless the Pope consecrates Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We all know this. What's he waiting for? What's he waiting for? Maybe Our Lady needs more of our penances, more of our rosaries, more of our love, more of our sacrifice, more of our taking the serious, the seriousness, the gravity of what the faith is about. And maybe that means for many families and priests who are sitting on the fence to stand up and defend Catholic tradition and oppose this liberal direction in the society from the leaders. So let's pray to the Mother of God, pray to St. Eustace and his wife and his two sons who are the family there in heaven. He's the patron of hunters. And let us ask St. Eustace to make us hunters, to search, to chase after, to run after Jesus Christ the King. That our hearts run after him with affection, with obedience to his laws and his commandments and uh, like his mother, to cling to him so that we come finally to see him face to face in heaven. And now he comes 
right down on the altar. He, the first hunter of souls, he hunts you down today. And he comes right down on the altar and gives you his sacred heart, gives you a blood transfusion of grace into your whole bloodstream, into your whole body and soul. He transforms you into, as he told St. Augustine, I change you into me. Such is the love of our King. Such is the love of this hunter of souls. Such is the love of the true God. And that's what we owe him back, our love and our adoration and our whole being. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us and have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us and have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.